Hello, uh, my name is Kate McCall, and this is a presentation on the Rothko Chapel. Um, this presentation is about the work of abstract expressionist Mark Rothko. It's a specific look into his work on the Rothko Chapel in Houston, Texas. The Rothko Chapel remains today one of the most interactive and special artworks in modern art. The Rothko Chapel is not meant to be simply a house for Rothko's massive color field paintings, but rather an interactive experience that transcends art. I think that in order to understand the work of Mark Rothko, we must begin by understanding him as an artist and person. After all, the man who said that this famous quote seen here, I'm interested in only expressing basic human emotions, tragedy, ecstasy, doom, and so on, he declared. And the fact that a lot of people break down and cry when confronted with my pictures shows that I can communicate those basic human emotions. If you are moved only by their color relationships, then you miss the point. This artist has a backstory, and it begins here. Born Marcus Rothowitz in Latvia in 1903, Mark Rothko came to the United States with his family in 1913. In 1921, he entered Yale University, but ended up leaving just a short two years later. At this time, New York was the place that modern artists needed to be. So he packed his bags and set off to the city. In New York City, Rothko began to study at Parsons School of Design under the painter Ashal Gorky in 1925. This would have a profound influence on his work, as well as other abstract expressionists of this time. There are a lot of surrealist influences and Ashal Gorky's work. This one, um, the one year, The Milkweed from 1944, shows a lot of surrealist influences in the work. We can see this sort of influence when we look at the early work of Mark Rothko as well. Gorky and Rothko both had an interest in surrealism and the way that surrealism deals with biomorphic forms. The way that these surrealist artists applied floating planes of color would later influence Rothko's work in his color field paintings. In this image, it's plain to see that the influence Ashal Gorky had on his artwork was very profound. Again, these paintings do differ greatly from the massive color field paintings that he would later become known for. They have incredibly surrealist feel about them and consist of not completely abstract images. Even the colors that Rothko used in these paintings is a nod to his surrealist interests. These remind me specifically of the colors commonly used in surrealist work, such as that of De Salvador Dali and André Breton. Rothko first developed his color field paintings in 1947. Described as color field painting by the critic Clement Greenberg, which was, of course, a term that really held on and stuck for good. It's an abstract expressionist style that is characterized by wide open space and an expressive use of color. We can see this in this piece, number 13, white, red on yellow where we can see large open spaces of the colors in this work. In my opinion, no one was more effective in creating this sense of environment than the colored field painters. They were concerned with an abstract statement in terms of large unified color shape or area. The colored field painters communicated their ideas in well-written manifestos and included many different artists, including Rothko, Newman, Still, and Gottlieb. They proclaimed that they were united by their belief 
that abstract art could express universal, timeless themes. They believed in emotion and in art's ability to evoke human emotion, even in it at its absolute most abstract level. Mark Rothko was a master in creating work that was incredibly emotionally deep, however simple. By the sheer sensuousness of their color areas and the sense of indefinite outward expansion without any central painting focus, the painting focus, um, the paintings are designed to absorb and engulf the spectator. So the emphasis of the work is placed on creating the experience for the viewer rather than simply in the artwork itself. Later in his artistic career, Mark Rothko would begin to turn to an ultimately darker color palette in his work. By 1968, Rothko's health was beginning to decline from many years of anxiety and his um, probably related to drinking and smoking habits. He also survived an aneurysm but still continued to smoke and drink despite doctor's orders not to. Many, people's, many people believe that Rothko's depression manifested itself in the darkness of his color choices for these later canvases. However, this idea has been questioned due to his later experiments with the power of dark colors. In 1964, the De, the De Manils, who were later coined the Medicis of modern art, prompted by personal grief, commissioned Mark Rothko to create a religious space. They paired him up with the architect Philip Johnson, who was at the time well known for his projects in New York City that included the Mod Museum of Modern Art's Sculpture Garden. This um, proved to be an interesting match later on, as the two didn't ultimately get along, but more on that in a moment. This commission was one of the most important commissions in Rothko's life. This was not going to be just a singular work of art, but rather the design of a space, the environment in which the art would mingle with architecture and other design elements. Rothko had very, very firm ideas about the building's design. Um, he wanted the chapel room to be octagonal, uh, with artwork on all eight sides of the octagon. However, he and the architect Johnson soon clashed over these specifics and other architects were ultimately brought in to help finish the plans. Uh, approaching the chapel um, from the south, you can see a steel sculpture called Broken Obelisk by Barnett Newman in the middle of a pool. It appears to be floating on the surface of the water. The chapel itself is windowless. It's octagonal, once again, and saw solid black doors on tiny glass-walled foyer. It seems it's actually a very simple-looking building when you walk up to it. The Rothko Chapel consists of 14 large panels that were designed to be similar, utilizing dark tones and red-brown tones. The idea behind the chapel is the creation of space designed to be an experience for the viewer or a total architectural pictorial experience. The main room is quiet and has a gray stucco walls. Each of those walls are filled by massive paintings. Some of the walls feature one canvas while others there while on others there are three canvases which hang side by side to form a triptych this is a definite nod to early christian altarpieces and triptychs above a skylight subdues the bright houston sun and the surfaces of the paintings change depending on the weather outside there are eight simple wooden benches that are just informally arranged on the floor, as well as a few meditation places for people to sit. At first glance, the paintings seem to be made up of solid dark colors, but when looked at closely, 
it is evident that the paintings are composed with many uneven washes of pigment and vary and create variations in every inch. In fact, Rothko was so intent on creating murals of religious residents that he spent three years only working on this commission. These paintings are among his most interesting that he ever created. They may appear from simply looking, um, they may appear from simply looking at pictures to be less developed than many of his other earlier color paintings from the 1950s. However, in person, these paintings are far more intricate and detailed than they let on. They truly envelop the viewer in an indescribable way and hearken to the original mission of the color fill painters, which was to elicit an emotional response from their viewer. It is interesting to consider the different critical interpretations of abstract and expressionist artwork. In many cases, because the work is so abstract, they simply have to speculate about the meaning behind the work. For example, some critics have discussed the possibility that Rothko's work is representative of landscape with sometimes horizontal rectangles or lines. But also, many critics also believe that Rothko's work to be reimagined images of medieval Christian altarpieces. This being said, Rothko constantly denied that his paintings represented anything at all and that they were created specifically to elicit the emotional response from the viewer. Rothko also specifically wanted a skylit space where you could have a direct connection to the natural world. He wanted you to be able to see the change in the seasons and the weather and the time of the day so that the paintings were constantly lit in a different way, depending on the time of day or season. This was much had a lot to do with the communication with the architects that were also constructing the building at this time. Um, he also is noted to have wanted the same lighting that he had in his studio in New York, which has prompted several re revisions to the chapel over time. The goal of those renovations was to better re-envision Rothko's choices about the lighting in the space, especially since the artist never lived to see the chapel completed. The space created in the Rothko Chapel is incredibly experiential. To be able to witness this space in person would be to be transported into a new way of thinking. The panels challenge people to look inward and to examine humanity on a whole new level. Ultimately, the paintings that are located in the Rothko Chapel are intended to convey existential wonder and not anguish. That was Rothko's ultimate goal in all of his work, states his son Christopher. He wanted us to really engage with the artwork and become part of the process of the art making. The Rothko Chapel remains today one of the most interactive and special artworks in modern art. The Rothko Chapel is not meant to simply house Rothko's massive colored field paintings, but rather to be an interactive experience that transcends art. Thank you very much.